Good morning. Candidates of all political parties are lined up like dominoes in their quest to become Michigan's next U.S. Senator. The incumbent Michigan senior senator, Democrat Debbie Stabenow of East Lansing, will retire after her current term ends next year. So today, before we introduce you to all of the political wannabes waiting in the wing, we talk past, present, and future with our state's first female U.S. Senator. It seems only proper that after more than 20 years in Washington, D.C., Senator Stabenow have the first say about the job she will be handing over to a new generation of political leadership. It's Sunday, August the 27th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. You've seen her on this program a zillion times. U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow, back here on Spotlight. Good seeing you again. It's, it's been a little while. It has been a little while, and it's always wonderful to see you. I so much appreciate all the work you do. It's good seeing yeah. you. The yeah. sets have changed over the years, yes. but you and I, we haven't changed. We have not One changed a bit. Yeah. No. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's fast forward to November of 2024, right. next year. Um, once you get past all that election and then January of that next year, you become private citizen again. <laughs> um, any regrets about your decision? Was it the right decision? Absolutely the right decision. No second thoughts? Not a second thought at all. You know, um, first, I've lived in Michigan my whole life and I'm going to stay in Michigan. I mean, come January 2025, I'm still going to be in Michigan. I'm still going to be fighting to protect the Great Lakes and, you know, making sure that we're at the head of the line and making things and growing things and your mental health and all the things that I've right. been working on. Um, but for me, um, I've been in public service a long time. It's been a wonderful honor, truly an honor uh, to represent Michigan. Was it a tough decision to make? It was tough in the sense that, you know, I love what I'm doing. I love the issues. I love getting things done. And I've been able to get a lot done, and I'm really proud of that. Number one, I want to pass the torch to the next generation and create new opportunities for people. The other thing is my own family. Uh, my mom's 97, not going to, still doing well, um, but she's 97. And yeah. so time with her is um, very precious. I have five wonderful grandchildren, my son. You want to spend a little time with them. I, I want to have an opportunity where it's midweek and that band concert <laughs> right now. And, right. You're yeah, not I'm, running to catch a plane yeah, at Detroit exactly. Metro exactly. I'm, I'm, or I'm in D.C. and listening, yeah. you know, watching it on video. I, you know, I want to be able to be there uh, watching it. And so I, it's just, it's time. What do you consider the hallmarks, your legacy? What do you want people to remember that you did when you were in the halls of Congress? Well, and as you know, Chuck, I started in county government, chairing a county board in the state legislature. In Ingham County Commissioner, yes, exactly, way back when. exactly. Yeah. When I was five, just to put that in perspective. <laughs> and, uh, and you were the, five in 1974, I, I, huh? Yeah, okay. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So the, uh, but, and then in four years, U.S. House and U.S. Senate. So rep, first of all, representing the whole state is just an amazing experience. We are such a wonderfully diverse state. I have led and authored the landmark legislation, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which is the permanent ongoing funding to protect us from all these things like invasive species to water quality issues and so on. So the Great Lakes, uh, and part of that's also economically, uh, making sure we have a second lock up in the Sioux, which we now have. I've been pushing on this for years so that if the one that's up there goes down, we don't lose millions of jobs because the freighters can't get through. Mm -hmm. So the Great Lakes, water is an asset from an agriculture standpoint. We grow more diversity of crops than any state but California, but they don't have any water. We are literally, you know, the, the place now with fruits and vegetables and diversity of crops thriving because we have water every day. Every day, my staff and I are focused on something that's related to what we need to do to protect our water. And that's a really important job for the next senator. And that's, of course, something that both Senator Peters and I uh, work on together. Auto industry, you know, I've been around long enough. I was involved in the auto rescue and what we had to do. And colleagues who, on the other side of the aisle, who said, you know, it really doesn't matter where we make cars as long as you can buy one. I was like, are you out of your mind? 
you know, all the, the supply chain, the 120,000 auto dealerships in the country, the making things. Yes, we need our army, depending on our, our technology, all of our national defense. But we got through that. I authored the very first clean energy manufacturing credits that, that helped begin uh, the industry to retool. I authored Cash for Clunkers, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. that I do to get remember people that. back into the, you know, get the, out of the bankruptcy. How do we get people back into the showrooms? And it was extremely successful. We are now doing what I had been advocating for years, production tax credits, where you don't just give the tax credit for the innovation created by a company. It's only if you make the product here. So battery production tax credit, solar, wind, this is all part of President Biden's plan, which I'm thrilled with because he's saying not trickle down, middle out, you know, put, we got to aim at the middle. And so, but all of these things, um, Buy America Law, strengthening them, got that in the book, a, books a year ago to really put accountability in decisions that are made about buying American products and goods. So hang on a second. Uh, I gotta slip a little pause for the cause in here. We'll come right back and we'll pick up on agriculture. Perfect. We'll be right back with Michigan Senior Senator Debbie Stabenow right after this. UAW in the midst of some very important right. negotiations. They've got a new leader, a uh, rather flamboyant leader who holds trash cans up and sends messages. Uh, if you had to send a quick message to both sides, what would you say to them? They need to be serious about coming together and getting a fair deal for workers. And it you know, needs, obviously, to work for the company. But we've got to make sure that with all these new things that I've been talking about and the new opportunities and jobs, um, that our workers are fully benefiting from that. We're going through a transition on uh, electric vehicles, and there's a lot of nervousness about what that means, different component parts made and, and so on. And so it's, it's just important that we, first of all, we have to have a strong, we have to make sure, this is the home team, the auto industry for us, that we're strong in supporting them. But that means supporting workers and that workers can have a good living wage, have benefits, uh, know that this is an, a long-term job for them that allows them to be successful. So it's very important that workers uh, get, their, get their fair share of, of what's happening. In Washington, D.C., um, there's a portrait of you uh, in the Senate committee that deals, deals with agriculture. It's a tradition, all the past chairs get a portrait there. Um, yours uh, is a little different <laughs> than the different. rest of them there. Uh, <laughs> and we'll put it on the screen. Uh, instead yeah. of some ornate looking office, uh, you're surrounded by fruits and vegetables. Yes, I am. You know, Chuck, we had a debate on this because every other portrait is somebody standing by a chair or at their desk and they're all kind of dark looking, you know, solemn. And uh, this is agriculture. <laughs> so I wanted to show you agriculture. You wanted to remember that you fought <laughs> yeah. for farmers in Michigan. Exactly. And so what we did, and it was hard because we grow more crops than I could ever even get into the portrait. But uh, so the I wanted to show folks, I've been the leader in general on agriculture, but specifically about half of what we grow are fruits and vegetables and what's called specialty crops. And until I got involved on in the Ag Committee, there was not a chapter of the Farm Bill, what we call a title, for specialty crops, fruits and vegetables. Half of, about half of what we grow was not included in terms of support through the Farm Bill. And so it was a big deal when I was able to finally get that done. And uh, for us, so much of what we grow, the greatness around Michigan involves fruits and vegetables or maybe other specialty crops like Christmas trees or now it may be hops or it may be a whole range of things. I think a lot of people didn't see you partisan when it came yeah. to issues that were near and dear to Michigan and agriculture is certainly one of them. Absolutely. You know, virtually everything I've gotten done has been bipartisan. I mean, there have been a few times, and, and during the Biden administration, for instance, when we took on the big drug companies, we couldn't have, none of our Republican colleagues would join us. So we had to do it in a way where we could, you know, cap insulin prices for seniors at $35 a month with just Democrats. But in general, I mean, everything I've done in agriculture, including last December, being able to get the first 
a full-time permanent program for summer meals for children across Michigan and across the country, bipartisan with my ranking member, Senator Bozeman from Arkansas. So everything has been uh, bipartisan in this area. And that's really how you get things done. I mean, we, we have different perspectives. I can argue all day about the Republican perspective on how you grow the economy, where it's all about tax cuts for the wealthiest and then hoping they'll trickle down. I don't think it works. I can argue all day about that. I can argue about having to have, you know, incentives to make things here and focusing on the middle class. But you can do that in a way that is respectful. Senator, are we treating mental health differently than when you first entered the U.S. Senate? Yes, and, and this is one of the things I'm actually the proudest of is that um, because we're now transforming the system, it's not all the way there, but we're transforming the system to fund mental health and addiction as health care. What in the past what's happened is you would have the health care system for physical health and then we fund mental health in the community uh, in mental and addiction through grants that stop and start. So there's no consistency. It usually has been done by the individual diagnosis of the person instead of funding the whole clinic. And so we're transforming that. And this was also bipartisan. Um, one of my very best friends in the Senate who retired uh, last time, uh, Roy Blunt from Missouri, has been a real partner with me. And we took the model of community health centers, which are so great in, in Detroit and across Michigan, they fund the whole center. And if they meet high quality standards, you fund the whole center. And we took that model and did behavioral health clinics. And so now across Michigan, we have 34 clinics. There are 10 in, in Metro Detroit area. And we're doing more. Uh, this is something that the governor and state legislature just put money in the budget to add to that for us. But what's happening now is you can go to any of these clinics, walk in the door, regardless of ability to pay, and you are able to get services for yourself or your child. And right now in Michigan, if you walk in or you call, you can be seen a third of the time you're seen the same day. Same day, not six months from now. And you have to be seen within 10 days. Working with the police department, there's more options now for folks to go to a crisis center that's being funded as a part of the clinic. They're not, people aren't sitting in jail or the emergency room. I mean, let's face it, the major way we have been dealing with mental health and addiction is through jails and emergency departments. We've got over 500 clinics across the country now, and I was really proud to be at the White House with President Biden in July to really celebrate and lift up uh, what we started. We're not done, but um, every community needs quality services for healthcare above the neck as well as healthcare below the neck. What do you want to finish up before you leave the halls of Congress and what's down the line for Debbie Stabenow? We'll be right back. Stay with us. Senator, 1994, uh, only time you suffered a defeat. Right. You ran for governor, you lost in the primary. Uh, looking back all these years later, was that a blessing in disguise? Because you could not have been governor for the amount of time you've right. been a U.S. Senator. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, Chuck, in, in life, you never know what's going to happen. You, you know, you, you do your best. And, and at the moment, at that time, you know, I so disagreed with the, the current governor, uh, uh, John Engler, that, you know, and I was in the state Senate, and so I moved ahead to run. In some, I do think, in, in many ways, it was a blessing. You never know what, what path that you're going to be provided. Um, governors have term limits. You know, U.S. Senate uh, and House do not, so it's certainly very different. But it, um, you know, it's never fun to lose, but we all go through something like this. It's and part of the democratic it's, process. It's part of the democratic process, and, um, and, and I just feel I've been blessed. I mean, you know, two years later, an opportunity opened up, and... Um, it's, I, I think everything I've had the opportunity to do has really been a blessing. Uh, they are lining up on both sides of the political aisle for your seat. Yes, yes. Uh, your thoughts about this, and are you going to weigh in on this? 
Well, you know, I've never endorsed in a Democratic primary, so... so you're going to stay out I, of this I, primary. I fully anticipate staying out, so we'll, we'll see how things go, well, but no, I fully no, let, anticipate. Let's, let's you know, you but, say, I fully anticipate. That's not a flat-out, I'm going to stay out of this. Um, yeah. Are you going to endorse before I don't, the Democratic primary is over? That is not... Or just it, let them duke it out among I, themselves? My plan is to let folks really duke it out. I mean, there are six people that have announced their interest, so we'll see how many get the signatures and are actually on the ballot. But we've got a, a wonderful diversity of people, and I definitely weigh in after the primary. I mean, right. I will lock arms with our nominee and uh, definitely move forward. But if at some point uh, one or two of them are super duper close, and polls are showing uh, the endorsement from the sitting senator just might put one person over the top, and they're coming to you saying, I've got to have your endorsement. At that point, will you reconsider or will you just well, say, I, Democrats, fight it out and whichever one wins, then see me in the general and I'll put the full force of my seniority and everything else uh, running up against whoever the Republican nominee is. Well, I'm, I'm definitely going to do that. I don't expect it no question to about be, that. yeah, I don't expect it to be that scenario you're talking about, but um, you know, I certainly, I uh, would listen to folks, but I've never endorsed in a primary, so I'm not planning on endorsing. I'll tell you what I am doing is do, putting in resources and a lot of time and effort with the Michigan Democratic Party. You know, I led back in 2017 this effort to have the best organization put in place. We call it the One Campaign, and, and we've been very successful in three elections. I'm now adding uh, more uh, resources on a communications end of it to talk about the great things that Democrats are doing, both President Biden, what we've been able to do nationally on bringing jobs home, growing the middle class and lowering costs, but also what's happening at the state level with the governor and the state house and senate. So more that's question. where I'm staying focused. Do you have a favorite right now? I'm just going to say we have great people in the race. So we, there, we've got great people in the race, and, and uh, we'll see what happens. There, there are some people who believe that uh, you would like Alyssa Slotkin well, to take is, that seat. Alyssa's uh, a okay. great congresswoman. I work with her, and so I understand that. There are other people in the race that uh, I've worked with over the years. And so I just want to make sure that we've got somebody who loves Michigan in, in, as much as I do and, and you know, really cares and, and could do the job. And so I see we've got a, a lot of good candidates, so we'll see what happens. All right. Um, looking ahead to the presidential election, are you nervous about whether or not Joe Biden, the current president, will get reelected or can get reelected uh, when you look at his poll numbers. We have a manufacturing renaissance going on. The CEO of U.S. Steel said he, it's the best thing that has happened in his lifetime and that it's actually a manufacturing renaissance. I mean, we're tackling the climate crisis. We took on the drug companies. We're bringing drug costs down. We took on the oil companies, you know, to, to focus on uh, climate and clean energy and foreign relations. He is completely turning around for us in terms of national security and our stature in the world. So count me in as a strong supporter uh, of Joe Biden. I have not seen, and I've worked with a lot of presidents, I have not worked with anybody as focused on the things that are right for Michigan than Joe Biden. All right, we're gonna take a quick little pause. We'll be back with more from U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow right after this. Democracy. You've been in elective office since 1974, various levels. Right, right. You know, local, state, and federal. Are you worried? Are you concerned about democracy? Because many people believe that it's at a crossroads right now. We are at a crossroads, Chuck. We really are. What gives me hope is that people haven't been engaging have been voting in Michigan, largest uh, non-presidential year election last year because people understood what was at stake. And there's so much at stake. But in Michigan, we've strengthened our voting laws. We've made it more fair on how we register lines. Uh, people have weighed in. Uh, and but the bad news is we're gonna have to continue to do that because we have forces both uh, you know, the extremists in this country and other countries who know they can't take us down militarily. 
that are definitely behind amplifying and trying to do everything they can to have us divided one against each other. Don't underestimate Russia. Don't underestimate Iran or China and what they are doing. It's very real and unfortunately, you know, we have a former president who has been willing to just amplify all of this in a way and take it to a level of violence we've never seen before. I mean, that's what worries me more than anything else when we have folks on a grand jury just doing their job down in Georgia and now their names and phone numbers and whatever addresses are put online with suggestions that there should be violence against them. This is going to a level that um, we should all be very concerned about. Do you believe that women and women's choice issues may make the difference in next year's presidential election one way or the other? The majority of voters are women. The majority of women want to make our own health care decisions. And we are seeing more and more the ramifications in states where women, whether it is wanting access to abortion or desperately wanting a child and having a miscarriage or something else happening where they can't get the care that they need. Um, it's very real now, I do believe that issues around reproductive freedom, and from my standpoint, it's freedom. It's freedom to make our own decisions on reproductive health care or any kind of health care in terms of freedom. And women of this country are very serious about understanding the ramifications of all of this. The next thing is birth control, and that's where this is headed. Uh, uh, you know, the efforts uh, around medical abortions or or the efforts around um, birth control and so on, is, it's getting more and more extreme, more and more extreme. And as it gets more extreme, the folks that are supporting those policies are going to find themselves on the losing end of elections. Final question, what can we expect from Debbie Stabenow, not Senator Debbie Stabenow, when you leave the halls of Congress. You'll hear from me in different ways. I, I'm not gonna run for office again. I'm not gonna have a full-time job. Never again. But no, I love this state. Um, I think it's the most beautiful, wonderful uh, place to live and raise a family. The people here are extraordinary. And so um, I'm just gonna keep doing what I can to promote Michigan. All right, Senator Sabina. Always good talking Thank to you. you. Uh, we'll see you again, I'm sure, before uh, you wrap it all up there <laughs> in Washington. And thanks for taking time to come in and share with us your thoughts on Spotlight today. Thank you. And I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the Spotlight. We hope you have a great week.